I don't take risks as a writer. I don't agonize or pull my hair out. I write for ordinary people, not for the literary elite. I love to write, and people seem to enjoy the books. I don't have any original ideas about human behavior and motivation. I don't have the ability to break new ground or to produce really powerful original fiction. Thanks, Eddie. I can't do it, and I don't want to. I'm perfectly happy doing what I'm doing. I do it the easy way. Get out of it. Oh. Oh. I'm a square pig in a square hole. What's going on here? It's Cliff Hardy. This must be Wet Graves. I know Jackson did this. It's part of a frame-up in the Benny Lenko case. I got the key out of the wall. I had to juggle the pizza in my manila envelope to use it. I ended by wedging the envelope between my knees, balancing the pizza box with my head and working the stiff key two-handed. He came out of the shadow. He struck hard, but the pizza saved me. It took a lot of weight out of the blade. And I felt it down to my toes, and the shutters almost came up. He was reaching for the envelope between my legs. I tried to butt him somewhere, anywhere. I connected. It hurt me, too. I was going down. The perfect target for the boot. Hey, what's going on there? The voice was coming from the church. Could it be God Almighty? I felt myself slipping and fading. Cliff Hardy's a Sydney private detective and uh, I invented him almost 20 years ago and almost 20 books back and uh, I think Cliff Hardy's the best idea I've ever had in my life. He's a uh, city, intensely city man and uh, I have a sort of love affair with Sydney so writing about Cliff Hardy has given me the opportunity to write about this terrific city. He says in, in one point that he prefers uh, pavements to paddocks and the tattoo parlour at King's Cross where it appears in some of the early Hardy books is a, a listening post for Hardy, a place where he picks up information. The tattooist is a character named Primo Tomasetti. In one of the books Primo says to Hardy, if you like I'll tattoo a Maltese falcon on your dick. And Hardy says something like, you wouldn't have a design big enough, mate. I love writing the Hardy books because uh, I feel very comfortable with the character. I just sort of shrug him on like an old coat and I can slip straight into the voice. I find it uh, a fun thing to do. isn't good enough for me to drive around the city so I get around on public transport trains when I'm going out of the city but buses when moving around Sydney itself and I've found that it uh, provides a tremendous source of the same kind of material I used to pick up when I drove and uh, maybe there were even extra benefits I can't drink in the pubs anymore, but uh, a writer needs characters, needs snatches of dialogue, needs uh, the texture of life. And you can pick this up in a bus very well indeed. What do you mean you can't drink in a pub? You had a drink in a pub about half an hour ago. Yeah, not the way I used to drink in a pub. Hang around in a pub for hours, drinking a lot. Now, one drink in a pub and I'm out of there. If you can't see a pub by looking both ways down the street, you must be outside one. Glebe, in the west of Sydney. It's where I located myself when I was a refugee from academic life in Victoria. So it's where I located Cliff Hardy when I uh, invented him. There's the Toxteth Hotel. That's uh, Hardy's local. It's a lot sleeker now than when uh, he and I arrived. It's a bit of a bloodhouse then. That's true of a lot of the suburb. Uh, 
terraces are cleaned up, it's all a lot greener. And hardy comments on that. There's enough bamboo in the front yard to make a campong or something like that. Hardy's always trying to crack wires about this sort of thing. We're coming down to Black Wattle Bay. There's a white rail fence there. It looks a bit fragile. I think Hardy comments on how fragile it is as he chucks a, a video cassette and a gun into the water. Uh, he's protecting someone. I think he's probably suppressing evidence at that point. Hardy's a bit of a maverick and uh, he'll do what he has to do. Almost every street in Glebe gives him something to say and this sort of lightens the mood or intensifies the dark mood. Here were books set in Australian streets. You know, you recognise the locations, you know, you'd walk through the Glebes, you know, you'd, you'd gone across the Harbour Bridge, you'd seen everything that he was writing about. You recognised Hardy as being distinctly Australian, you know, he drove a falcon, all of those things that had been missing from crime fiction. And I think, you know, people were maybe getting a little tired of, of reading books about the mean streets of New York, Los Angeles, Detroit, and, you know, and what had been happening with, with overseas crime fiction. So, you know, the advent of something specifically located in Australia was, was you know, one of Corus's great achievements. And I think the reason that the books were initially so, so popular. We're at Randwick Racecourse at dawn. I love places like this. They're a sort of world all of their own. They run by their own rules. There's a shady side to the racing game, the same as there is and always has been in boxing. And I made use of this as a backdrop and a context in the second Cliff Hardy novel, White Meat. I'd seen him a couple of times in the flat at Randwick Racecourse. Six foot one and fifteen stone of expensive suiting and barbering with jewellery and shoe leather to match. I'd given him some of my money and he'd put it in a bag. I hadn't liked him much. It's hard to like people you lose money to. I suppose we'd exchanged 20 words, not more, on the course. So I was surprised when he rang me at the office. He was lucky to catch me. I had an appointment that afternoon and called in to check the mail on a whim. Private detecting slow in the winter and I wasn't expecting any notes and in invisible ink or bundles of currency. I thought briefly about ignoring the phone, but couldn't do it. Hardy. The voice was rich. Pickled in Corvoisier. Jack Kennedy. Got a little job for you. Good, I'm free. Tomorrow, dear? Today will do me. Now. He could take my money, but not my pride. Sorry, Mr. Kennedy, I can't make it. I've got an appointment. Yeah, I heard with the at the gym in Newtown. Get over here straight after that. You've got time. Tickner had called an hour ago asking me to meet him. He didn't say why and he'd been secretive about the whole thing. But Big Jack knew. Interesting. All right. Where's here? Jab, jab, jab. How do you get a client who has a problem? Cross it. And that's the starting point. But what I find is that Hardy himself rapidly becomes a catalyst for events. His intervention triggers reactions. In some instances, someone ends up dead who might not have ended up dead or damaged. You know something's going to happen. I've been uh, coming to the boxing and going into gyms for 40 years now, since uh, when my uncle took me as a kid in Melbourne. And things have changed a bit. Back then uh, it was all turf cigarettes and beery breaths and men in heavy woolen clothes. Uh, that's changed. But the dramatics of the business are, are still the same. There's, uh, there's conflict and there's drama in every second of it. And it's terrific for writing. You can write about pain, you can write about love even, and a lot of emotion. A hell of a lot of emotion in boxing. Right, now you see what I tell you. I'm more work than a killing instinct to be ready. Maybe. I run a film!
for better or for worse, boxing's all we've got left of gladiator fighting, dueling, bear baiting, even public execution. It's always been a very controversial business with its passionate supporters and passionate opponents. I'm somewhere in the middle. I sort of love it and I hate it and it's always interested me. It's had an interesting history and I've written about that in a book called The Lords of the Ring. It was the first non-academic book I wrote and before I started to write fiction. And that's a history of boxing in Australia. And the history in Australia stretches right back to the convict days. We had our bare knuckle era and our great early glove fighters. And the whole business boomed, of course, during the Depression when men would fight for a pound, fight for 20 rounds for a couple of quid. There'd be fight nights three or four nights a week and they were real rough and tumble affairs. I've written one novel about boxing called The Winning Side with a boxer as the central figure. He's an Aboriginal boxer. His name's Charlie Thomas. He symbolised for me all the great Australian black boxers stretching right back to those early days. Jeez, good example. She's got to get tougher. We'll have to see him down. Joy seeing him bleed. Oh, shit. I just need to see Hardy. Sick of you, Tigna. I just need Ricky Thompson's address. Clear out, Tiny. Better not, Tiny Pinky. It could go for a salt. Piss off, Ricky's not here. You upset my boys. Piss off. Tiny, get back in the bag. Wait a minute. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Albemarle Street, Redfern, 145. Oh. Tiny sank his fist into the heavy bag. Truman sat down and started massaging his neck. We went out. Raymond Chandler and Ross MacDonald were not only inspirations, but I outright stole from them. I pinched bits of the plots. Uh, the, the very character of Cliff Hardy is a modification of Philip Marlowe, Raymond Chandler's character. And Lou Archer, uh, Ross MacDonald's character, was an influence too. I, I lifted plots and scenes and even turns of phrase. Uh, I call it pastiche rather than plagiarism. And it took me about three or four books to get past that and get my own voice. We do call this formula writing. We do know that there's not very much that you can pull out of that sort of stuff. It's not changing our view of the world in any way. It's, you're not getting that hit that comes from something which is so beautiful and so challenging and so exciting and so annoying sometimes too. You know, a book that really angers you because it's really moving around your own world view. We're not going to get that in crime fiction. I know people who think Salman Rushdie's the greatest writer who ever lived and Marquez is just behind him and that whole rash of South American uh, magic realists and writers like Peter Carey who work in that kind of vein. I know people who, who couldn't live without it. I can live without it very, very easily. It doesn't resonate for me. It, it sits on the page dead for me. I think I'm pretty much influenced by movies and television. Most 20th century writers are but popular writers, genre writers, formula writers like me, I think are, are bouncing off uh, movies and television a lot. Popular culture, mass media, reaching as many people as possible. That's what I'm trying to do. Getting a cab in the rocks at half past four in the afternoon is no easy matter. That's how it was as I ran along Pump Street to the nearest corner. Quick. I finally hailed down a cab. She dropped me off to the old state library building. Here we are. I ran past the fountain and through the gate. I took the first path that seemed to promise a view of the bridge, almost fell on the steps and dashed past a statue of a Greek god doing godlike things. 
some kind of arch led me toward a vantage point. The sky was clear and rapidly turning pink and orange in the west as the sun sank. Some instinct or memory told me to keep the duck pond on my right. The bridge itself kept disappearing behind trees as I hurried along the paths. I hurdled a plot of native something or others and ran up a rise to a bench. There was no one on the bench, but a shape lay on the ground beside it. He was lying on his back, very still. A thin, odd-looking figure with a big overcoat spread out around him. His long beard lay on a red T-shirt. Blood had splashed on his clothes and the grass from a gash in his forehead. His eyes were open, and so was his mouth. I looked up and saw the bridge etched clearly in the sunset. It was the first time I'd ever seen it like this. But Stan Livermore would never see it again. My favourite American crime writer is James Elroy. I think he's the best crime writer in English in the world today. He thinks so too. He's stripped away a lot of the um, bullshit about crime writing and has cut through to a, a real psychological understanding of the cops and the crims and how close the psyches of both groups are together. Uh, there's something immensely convincing about that. You're giving people exactly what they want. The right amount of sex, the right amount of violence, the right amount of action. What for? Are this? It just seems to me that you, you really are reinforcing all the, the worst aspects of that kind of writing, which is that you don't get any surprises along the way. Do you ever really bother to quote a Peter Corris novel? The sun was going down as I stopped started along in the lane for drivers who didn't have the right money to pay the toll. The sky was clear and the water turned red gold. The ferries and sailing ships seemed to be skating along a sheet of beaten bronze. I was buying 15 minutes of a hundred million dollar view for a dollar fifty. A bargain. I've never won any kind of awards for fiction writing. So this plaque means a hell of a lot to me. It, it's sort of like winning the grand final and the New South Wales Tennis Open and the PGA Golf Championship all rolled up into one. I'm very proud of it. It's something permanent. And uh, I have this fancy that I might bring my grandchildren here to see it. You're in very good company here with these other writers. Mostly dead, unfortunately, but uh, some names that it's... Uh, it would be, I would aspire to, li to live up to some of the books they've written. I'm still trying. Peter's strengths as a writer are um, certainly his dialogue. I mean, he's, he's, he's a very, 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 very good at, at capturing, you know, the, the way people speak, the way, you know, the, they interact with each other. Uh, he's very, very strong on place. I mean, you know, he, he really gets Sydney in particular down better than, than any other crime writer you know, by a long shot. Bondi is very special to me. I've, I once said that nothing bad has ever happened to me in Bondi, and that makes Bondi special. I've never had a bad time there, and I hope that when I write about Bondi, something of that, uh, that, that positive flavour comes through. Other places uh, have uh, knocked me around a bit. Uh, I was unhappy in uh, a flat I had in uh, another location in Sydney, and so I think that probably takes on a, a blacker aspect when I'm writing. So I, I do emotionally relate to the places I'm writing about and I hope that that comes through in the writing. Where was that, that place? That was a flat I had in Crown Street, Darlinghurst. Uh, nice flat, but uh, bad time. I came out of the sleep fairly fresh and shaved with an old blade and the motel soap. hurt. Thought of Ailsa, my rich ex-woman who bought me soaps and shampoos and shaving creams and kept me smelling nice. Then I thought of Sin, my ex-wife, who didn't give a damn after a while how I smelt or what I did or thought or said. Funny thing was, I missed them both. Jean and I were together for 11 years and uh, these two are the result. 
been apart for seven years and I'm speaking for myself. Uh, I fell in love with Jean again and we've been together for three years, married for two. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't read about it, you wouldn't write it. I'm not sure it'd play. <laughs> It's just terrific to have a second go at something you messed up the first time round. Yeah. You know? yeah. I got upset at, at very early on in the split when um, Mim, who was very little, said to me, is it my fault? And that really broke me down. But we've talked about it since, since we all got back together again. And I think I didn't hear her properly. And I think she now claims she said, is it your fault or <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, I, I suppose I went a tiny bit off the rails. Stopped going to school and stuff. And it was just interesting uh, the way they, they dealt with it. It was just like, oh, well, she's just doing this because she is. And She'll just, get over it. Yeah. But, and then, I don't know, I think that was one of the only times when you two actually would get together and talk was when you were talking about us, wasn't it? So that was interesting as well. Was it your fault? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Not I, at all. I, I, refused, oh, no. I refused to shoulder 100% of the blame. Um, I'll take 25% uh, of the blame on this shoulder, 25% of the blame on that shoulder, and um, the rest uh, you know, other people can, can allocate. Um, it was a funny, it was a time when people were trying different ways of living and uh, experimenting with, with things, attitudes and, and ways of uh, being together and being apart and we just sort of fell down a, a big wide crack. How's that? Sure. <laughs> I looked down at the cult on the table and wondered if my ex-wife's sin hadn't been right all along about this job. You deal with damaged people, she told me, because you damaged yourself. You can't operate with normal, decent people. What do you think of his books, Ruth? Oh, they're quite good. I've actually started reading quite a few recently. I haven't really thought about it much. Um, That's the point, isn't it, Dad? Yeah. What's the point? You don't have to think. You just <laughs> read them. You just read them and enjoy them at the time. She doesn't sort of rip the pages out of the printer, sort of des desperate to, to see what's going to happen to, to Cliff Hardy next, no. Now that's what all writers want. Uh, they want someone standing by the typewriter, ripping the pages out and reading them there and then and saying, this is fabulous. Hey, it doesn't... Great stuff. Thank you, I do. I perform this function myself. <laughs> <laughs> great really stuff. Yes. They're working and you suddenly hear coming from the study, great stuff. And the girls roll their eyes and Dad's having a good morning. <laughs> he cut the stitches of each bundle and pulled aside the seam of the first. There was a smell now, all right, of old meat and old milk and rotten eggs and Everything else bad you can think of. Cast airs tucked the canvas apart. The corpse had ruptured. The mess was like a dozen or more squirming green black half skinned rabbits. This is the best argument I've ever seen for cremation. I'd uh, run the character Cliff Hardy around the suburbs of Sydney for a, a couple of years and I wanted to do a book that was set absolutely dead centre in the city. And to me, that was the harbour. And I'm not sure if it's geographically true, but the bridge seems to be the centre of the harbour. I mean, it's a most remarkable engineering feat in its day. I think it was the longest single span bridge in the world. And uh, in the Depression, when it was being built, it symbolised hope and optimism, a sort of last gasp of pioneering in a way that a major physical barrier to the operation of the city could be overcome. It was very exciting. It was visually exciting at the time. The 
two arches stretching out to meet each other. They're, they're terrific images. And uh, it was a bloody dangerous job. Uh, lives were lost. There were lots of stories connected with the building of the bridge. But uh, for wet graves, I cooked up my own story, which was basically that someone is killing off the descendants of the original architects and engineers of the bridge. Three of them. Could be more. Three bodies were enough for me. They all wrapped their canvas, short chains to cement plugs. I touched one, and it's squishy. They're sort of pretty close together. I was in the dead set middle under the bridge. Jesus, I should have seen them. Half floating, half hanging there. something about being sorry to put him through it, but I didn't see the point. He drew in several deep breaths as if trying to cleanse his insides. Then he looked out at the water and the land and moved off along the boat before climbing aboard. You all right there? What? You need any help there? No, I'm fine. How about you? Just throwing about. It's a habit of mine. Would you... Too rude if I asked you what you're doing. We're minding our own business, mate. Why don't you do the same? That's a bit rude. What's the matter? Bloody nutter. I don't know. This place is giving me the creeps. You know who that is? That's the murderer. That's the guy who's been dumping the bodies under the bridge. I love writing. I love everything about writing. Like a pipe smoker likes filling his pipe and tapping down the tobacco. Those little rituals of, of pleasure and comfort, they apply to me with writing. I love turning on the word processor and putting in the disc and getting the program up and running. I find those very fulfilling and satisfying things to do. The actual writing itself most days is the most fun I have that day. His weaknesses are certainly, I think, that, that he writes too quickly and that he writes too much. I, th I would love to see what Peter Corus would come up with if he was given the luxury of having, having 12 months to write one book. I write five or six pages a day, every day, and that gets me about 12 to 1,500 words a day, which produces one of the shorter books in six weeks. And I write four or five of those a year, sometimes putting in one of the longer historical novels. And I have to maintain that sort of level of output to make a living. I average about six or seven thousand dollars a book. So uh, that's, the, that's the requirement to make a living from fiction writing in this country. Surely the only way to make one different from the last one is to, ha is to mix it up a bit to shock you a bit and to have something happening you didn't expect to happen. But if you do it too fast, how, how many surprises can you put in a, a book you write in a month? Spontaneity in writing is what uh, gives me a high, gives me a kick. I, I detest rewriting. I would hate to slow down. I'm sure whatever, whatever flavour and uh, zest and enjoyability there is in the writing comes from that speed, and I think to labour over it would probably kill it. So I think they're wrong. So you don't think you would actually write a better book? I don't think so. I'll never write a great book. I won't. An extraordinary thing happened to me when I was 19. My first girlfriend, I'd only been with her for a few weeks, was killed in a car accident. And I became friendly with the boyfriend I'd replaced. He lived in Sydney. We used to write to each other quite regularly. And not long after she died, I began to have 
this dream and it became a recurring dream that lasted for a couple of years that I would drive to Sydney in a blue falcon and such was my ignorance of the city that in the dream although dreams don't pay much account of reality I suppose I would drive over the Sydney Harbour Bridge turn left through King's Cross and go down to Bondi and the blue falcon motor car that I gave Cliff Hardy when I wrote the first book, The Dying Trade, nearly 20 years later, that blue falcon is the blue falcon from that dream. Oh, Christ. God, I just wrote this today. Latest Hardy. It's called Dead Quick. The private eye story is the uh, city version of the Western. And uh, these kinds of stories are, are about violence and collision. They're not quiet indoor stories. They're action stories uh, in the outdoors. And uh, the private eye is something like the gunslinger. And the gunslinger cops it. Uh, I've put him in hospital a few times. Uh, he limps around from time to time. He's broken the odd bone. Um, and there are softer things that happen, uh, emotional problems that uh, beset him. So uh, varying that mix is, is fun for me. And do you think it's you putting yourself out there, but he does the work? Yeah, there's a sense of that. There's a sense of me uh, pretending to be tough, just trying out what it would be like to be tough out 17 there. 17 books already and still no sign of you slowing down. I get beaten senseless in nearly every book. Just give it a break. People still tend to forget and not realise the diversity of the material that he um, that he produces. You know, you, you have the whole string of historical novels like Naismith's Dominion and Gulliver's Fortune. Then you have, you know, his his um, you know Crawley character dealing with sort of Asio and all of all of that side of, of things. Then you have Dunlop in the Witness Protection Plan. You have the Richard Browning books with the you know the out of work sort of you know Australian actor attempting to make it overseas. You know, that's an extraordinary array of of ground to cover. And with very, very few exceptions, you know, Peter pulls, you know, it all off superbly. My guess is you don't exactly know where your orders are coming from. Doesn't that worry you, Mr. Charlesworth? It would. Oh, it would me too. At least I know who I'm working for. But who is that, Crawley? Myself. The great thing about spy writing is really the blend of gritty reality and absolute fantasy. You have to play those two things together. I'm not interested in cleaning out the intelligence services and making A accountable to B and B to C. Hell, that's part of the fun, isn't it, that it's all so uh, chaotic? <laughs> you say so. I was thinking more of treacherous. You sound drunk. I might be. But I might not be too, eh? There's an argument that, uh, that, that the intelligence services, as we know them, all grew up in the First World War out of the imagination of a pulp writer of the time who managed to convince the British government the place was swarming with German spies and he got himself a department and bureaucrats and all the rest of it. And uh, MI5 and 6 kind of grew from that. Uh, that that's very appropriate because spy writing has become an enormous industry. What do you want, Crawley? I want a meeting in Canberra. Something's going on that none of us know anything about. Whatever it is, it's bad news for you and me. We're being used. If you can't smell it, you better transfer to trade and finance today. It could be right. Before you come, find out anything you can about something with a code word Lexington. Check the computers. Ask around. Lexington. Got it. In the Crawley books, one of the things I'm doing is examining the intelligence world as I see it, and that is a world of incompetence, cover-up, deception by pathetic people for puerile ends. And Ray Crawley's drawn into the dirtiest bits of this business 
and he despises it as much as I do. Violence in the intelligence world has got more purpose and often has a double purpose. In the Drano torturing scene in the Kimberley killing, what Crawley's doing there is not just getting information, he might be indulging in a slightly sadistic impulse in his own nature. But what he's also trying to do is show Charlesworth that intelligence work is not just paper shuffling and report writing, but it can be violent and vicious. Lexington's a very dangerous word, David. I hope you were discreet about it. I wasn't. Not at all. Well, do you know who gave the orders when you got me into this? No. Someone very high up. Very high up. Who'd you report to? I don't know. I want you two to stay here. Lock the door after me. Share your ideas. See if you can uh, figure out who's behind all this. I'll go out and see who's coming to find us. Really, Crawley, this is all so very melodramatic. Huh? This is the crunch. Not that I expect you two desk flies to realise that. So just sit tight. If I come back, you know my voice. You can let me in. What if you don't? Do what you want. Jump out the bloody window. Crawley, you set me up. Yeah. How does it feel? very few raunchy books around in Melbourne in the 1950s. Uh, sex in print was hard to come by. Sinue the Egyptian scenes in that book, sex was described vividly and precisely. What went where and how the parties felt about it. I found it very exciting. Read it when I was about maybe 13 or 14, a bit of a late starter and uh, it excited me and I began to masturbate. My first masturbatory images were of uh, kind of pharaohs and their ladies. And uh, sex has, has remained troubling to me. I think that, that fantasised start has uh, given me some difficulties through my life. What kind of difficulties? Um, sexually insecure and not sexually confident. I've never been a sexual initiator and uh, the male role in our society is, is, for, is for the male to initiate sexual contact. I always had trouble with that. I get over it in my writing of course because the, uh, the characters are much more sexually confident and aggressive than me.